Hi, my name is Gerdy Verwoerd and you're listening to Daring Self Leadership and the Nature Connection. I think the internet is amazing and has allowed me to meet people all over the world that I would never have been able to meet if it hadn't been there. And without the internet, I would not have become aware of Nicole Snell, today's guest. She first popped up in my Instagram timeline. And at the time I was converting a video series on safely solo hiking among mountains into a podcast. Where I was focused on the technical aspects of safely hiking mountains and frankly any other natural environment, Nicole brought my, brought my attention to an aspect which I never truly considered. And though I'm loath to say it, an aspect that is especially important to solo female hikers, even more so when those female hikers are part of the BIPOC community, the community of people that are black, indigenous and people of color. The fact that I never even thought about that element of hiking safely likely has to do with the fact that I'm over six feet tall. As you have probably heard, I have a rather low voice for a woman, I have very short hair, and because of it, I've often been mistaken for a man. However, it also says volumes about the white privilege with which I move through the world. So when I started following BIPOC people in the outdoor space on social media, it became very clear to me how safety is something they have to take into consideration in a way that until then had never even occurred to me. Now I invited Nicole to be a guest on the podcast because she clearly is someone who practices self-leadership and she has a strong connection with nature. I did not invite her to specifically talk about the outdoor experience of BIPOC people, though I'm sure it will be part of our conversation, as that experience is also Nicole's. So let me introduce you to Nicole Snell. She's a dynamic and award-winning international speaker and self-defense expert, specializing in sexual assault and violence prevention education, boundaries and personal empowerment. She is the CEO of Girls Fight Back, the world-renowned personal safety and self-defense seminar for women and girls, and she is the creator of Outdoor Defense, an online series that aims to help women stay safe while enjoying the outdoors or traveling solo. Nicole is also an avid solo traveler, outdoor enthusiast and adventurer, having visited 26 countries on six continents to date, and is an adventure leader for Black Girls Trekking. She is an NACP credentialed advocate and sits on the board for Impact Personal Safety in addition to being a lead instructor. She has traveled the world speaking to groups at colleges, K-12, corporations, the US military and private events. She believes that everyone has the right to walk through the world feeling safe, powerful and confident. So let's dive into my conversation with Nicole Snell. Nicole, welcome to the podcast. So happy you're here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be speaking with you. We've we met online, I think through LinkedIn at the beginning of the year. It's nice to finally be doing this. Yeah, yeah. I found you on LinkedIn, but I think I've been following you longer than that because I found somehow I found you on um, Instagram. I don't know why, maybe because you tag hiking and I do hiking and I did a podcast or I was converting a video series on um, safety hiking mountains and you do a lot of, around safety when hiking among other other things so um, anyways I've been following you I've been you know sharing your videos with other people that are also hiking and are afraid of going into the mountains by themselves so I thought you know I really want this lady to uh, to come on this podcast so and here you are. That's great. I am thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah. So when uh, you start, you're now very active in um, self defense and and um, with girls fight back and with self defense training for women and and other genders and even men if they if they want to. Um, but you started out in the entertainment industry and um, that is. An entirely different um, field, I guess, even though, you know, from the stories that people tell, um, sometimes you may have to, it can come in very handy when you know some self-defense. But, you know, having said that, how 
did you start out in the entertainment industry, even worked for Endemol, which is a Dutch company, and um, and then at some point switched to working to the, for the Navy and eventually rolled into what it is that you're doing now. How did that all happen? Oh, it's such a interesting story to share because the two industries are like night and day. But hmm. really, like you said, you know, self-defense is helpful no matter what industry you're in. You know, the yeah. skills aren't just the physical skills. So, yeah, there are definitely things that I learned in the industry or times when I had to assert myself or assert my boundaries that, you know, you use in the industry. But basically, I, I got a I was valedictorian in my high school, got a full scholarship to Cal State Long Beach. And as part of my degree, I wanted to do an internship in the entertainment industry. And I interned at a company that was a, a they call it a turnkey stage where the stage is empty. It has all the gear there. And if you want to come and run out the stage, you know, companies would come and rent out the space. And I remember my first day there and I'm learning about all the lights and the cameras. This is back when we were shooting on beta cam before things went HD and digital. There's a tape room, there's cable. I learned how to wrap cable. I learned all the different, you know, physical aspects of production. And I was just so curious about everything. And I had originally thought that I wanted to go into acting because I loved being on stage. I loved performing. I was getting a degree in speech communication. But then after I discovered the working, the workings of behind the scenes in production, I really got hooked. I really loved all the puzzle pieces of all the different departments working together and mm -hmm. how everything, you know, creates this final product. And then once you shoot it, everything comes down and you start from zero again. It was just very, it was just very interesting to me. And I, I just fell into that. So I started as an intern, became a production assistant, and then slowly started working my way up the production ladder. I became mm -hmm. an assistant coordinator and then a coordinator, production manager and line producer. And then my final job in the industry when I was working at Endemol was the director of digital production for original digital content. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was where my track was going. You know, I had spent 12 years building it up. I worked with motorsports companies. I worked internationally and did shoots abroad. I worked with commercial clip shows, you know, worked with small budgets, large budgets, lots of different crew, lots of different types of projects. I think I produced 75 plus projects over the course of my career of all mm -hmm. varying budgets and sizes. And I really enjoyed the camaraderie of working with the people on my crew and the staff. But as I started, you know, growing into, you know, my position and, and getting, having more and more responsibility and doing more mm -hmm. and more in the industry, I just had this feeling like I wanted to do something more for women. And I wanted to do something that was going to be rewarding and actually helping to change the world. You know, there are some projects out there that, you know, are very socially conscious and social yeah. justice mm -hmm. conscious. But you, if I wanted to only work on those projects, then I would be limiting my job you know, yeah. availability. And so I was thinking to myself, well, you know, I, I love what I do. I'm good at it, but I really want to do something more. But I wasn't sure what that meant. I didn't know speaking and teaching was a career path you could take, especially mm -hmm. that's not what I've been doing the last 12 years. My, yeah. my know-how was in physical production from development through delivery. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was going to eventually end up, you know, a senior VP somewhere. And, you know, that was, that was what you do. You just keep climbing the ladder and, and, and that's what you do. Yeah. But I I was at Endemol and I was contacted by a group that I was involved with in my college mm -hmm. that did domestic violence and sexual assault prevention workshops. And they had been contacted by the Navy because the Navy got a hold of what they were doing and wanted to incorporate that into their SAPR training, which is sexual assault prevention and response training. Mm. And so they reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to be a facilitator. And I said, I would love to help, but I have a full time job. Mm -hmm. Don't really know that I would be available, but please keep me in mind. And not long after that, I found out that Endemol was getting rid of our entire original digital content department. Wow. Everybody was getting laid off. And we were finishing a project, a really fun project with Blizzard Entertainment. It was one of my, the most fun projects I did. Mm -hmm. I love World of Warcraft. <laughs> and so it was really fun to produce you a it. show based on that. Yes, I got hooked playing it while working on that project. <laughs> <laughs> and so 
I, we got to finish up that project. And so I reached back out and said, well, hey, as of this date, I'm going to be available. And that happened to be the date the contract started for them working with the Department of Navy. And I thought, well, you know what? This this is something that I'm mm-hmm. wanting to do. It's speaking. I'm going to be teaching and training individuals. You know, in the military, you're mostly teaching men because the armed forces are primarily yep. male, at least in the United States. And so I was like, great, we're going to get information out to to everybody that needs to hear this. And I'm going to be doing this rewarding work that I wanted to do. Mm. And so I was like, well, you know, I'll try it out and see. I wasn't sure how financially stable I was going to be doing this brand new thing. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, well, I'll do it for a year and see what happens. Well, the group, the way I got connected with the Girls Fight Back is they worked with the group. The owner of the company had an agency that was working with this with the group and helping them with the contracting part of it. And I looked them up and I saw the program Girls Fight Back. And I thought, What? I looked it up. I read all about it. And I said, wait, wait, wait. I mean, you mean I can travel to colleges teaching self-defense and empowerment? And I love to travel. I've always loved travel. It's one of my favorite parts of working in TV production and taking personal trips. So I thought, wow, I get to travel and I get to teach people yeah. and have this this piece of me that I knew was missing, this being able to empower women. It was right there in front of me. So I, being the go-getter that I am, (laughs) I emailed the owner and asked for a job and said, I really want to work with you. I don't know what that entails, but how can I do this? Mm -hmm. And they didn't have a job opening right away, but three months later they did. And so I got trained. And so at the time I was doing work with the Navy, traveling with the group. We traveled uh, domestically and abroad to U.S. military installations. I've been to over 90 U.S. military installations worldwide Mm. and doing this type of training. And so I was doing that as well as doing college events domestically. Yeah. And then I wanted, I I really felt like I needed to do more on the self-defense side. Like I really wanted to, to do more work with Girls Fight Back. And so I started doing that. So I slowly stopped working um, as much with the company that was doing the military trainings. And I got more into doing more trainings with Girls Fight Back and figuring out how we could expand. We had already expanded to all genders, but I really wanted to expand from the college market, which is where we were primarily doing our teachings Mm -hmm. and take it wider, take it to corporate audiences, take it to the travel industry, take it to all different types of people and organizations that need this type of empowerment training, learning to use your voice, learning how to navigate uncomfortable situations with coworkers and Mm. how to feel confident doing things solo or managing yourself. And then I continued to work with Girls Fight Back. And then last year, the owner was selling and I decided to buy it. (laughs) Congratulations. Thank you. That must have been a really exciting and scary step to take oh talk about scary (laughs) we you know we we're planning this this you know this purchase we started talking about it in before the pandemic so like january yeah february and then march hits and that's when we're finalizing everything and that's when the pandemic hits yeah everything we've done to this point the company was live we didn't do anything virtually and so I was really scared because I thought, well, what am I going to do? Like, I definitely know that this is the right move because I feel like I would be the right person to carry this company forward since Mm -hmm. I've been involved for seven years. And I really believe in our mission. And I wanted to keep the memory of Shannon McNamara alive. And she's the woman the company was founded for. Mm. And I just figured I'm going to do this. And I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to figure out how to make everything virtual. I'm going to figure out how to reach people because I think this education is important even during a pandemic, if not more important, because you're dealing with a lot of heightened emotions and people were doing a lot more things solo who had never done that before because of social distancing and not being able to go out with people. And so, yeah, I just, I just figured out I was just going to work hard and keep, keep doing what I knew was right, which was trying to empower other people and Mm -hmm. just hope everything would work out. So far, so far, (laughs) so far, it seems to be working out. Okay. (laughs) That is some story, but there's a, um, a key moments in your life, really. Either you reached out to somebody like you did with, um, girls fight back 
or um, you know, the, and the mall decides to just you know dissolve an entire department uh, at a moment when you're thinking about what is it that I um, that I want to do with the rest of my life? Do I want to continue on this career path, or do I, you know, dare to step onto a different trail? And um, even you know, it must have been challenging and, and scary again. You know, it, it may have felt right, but at the same time scary, because I'm assuming, you know, at end the mall, at the position you were in, you were making good salary, which was good probably, salary. and a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, other benefits. And then there's um, my own uh, office. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> yeah, t- international travel. Da, da, da. Yeah. And then you step into Girls Fight Back and probably take a huge salary cut. Yeah, it's definitely uh, it's definitely a cut, <laughs> but mm-hmm. I am so much happier now. I am so much more fulfilled and rewarded with the work that I'm doing, and mm-hmm. that's nothing that money can buy. Money can't buy that that peace of mind, that feeling of every morning waking up and loving what I'm doing and mm-hmm. knowing that I'm helping people, even people I've never met, people who've only ever watched my videos or communicate with me online telling me about how my my posts or my video or something I've taught them or they attended mm. a virtual class, how it's helped them in their lives. And now they feel comfortable taking a solo hike or going on a solo trip. That is priceless. Yeah. And I am, like I said, just the, the joy that I have in the work that I do, not to say that I didn't like working in production, but let's be honest, it's stressful. There's a lot of stress yeah. involved. There's a lot yeah. of 16 hour days and seven day weeks. Yeah, and deadlines and budgets yeah. and, uh, and budgets are always tight because it's it sounds like project management, which is what I used to do. And yeah, there's always a tight budget. There's always too uh, little time. And there's yep. always a client or somebody who wants, go- we used to say golden taps when they have budgeted for brass, maybe. Yes. Someone wants a helicopter and I'm saying, you know, we can't afford a helicopter, but I can get you a drone (laughs) or, you know, hey, the last minute we want to shoot in this really expensive location. And I'm like, okay, let's think about what else we can do because we don't have the time to apply for this permit and we don't have the money for it. And I mean, I got to say, I've been I've been work. I worked on some really fun projects and Mm -hmm. had some really fun asks that I was really proud I was able to do. I got asked to provide a zebra for a shoot and found the zebra but then the location told us what are you thinking no you cannot bring a zebra here producers didn't think about that they were just like hey nicole we need the zebra and i was like Mm -hmm. okay so i got you a zebra Mm -hmm. i had to get a chimpanzee for a shoot too also also got it and we were two what a day before two days before flying to germany for a shoot at the nurburgring Mm -hmm. and the producer decided they wanted to add a helicopter shoot and it's two days before we already had a permit and i'm thinking okay well i have to get on the phone with the local production company and see where you know where we can get a helicopter where it's gonna land where it's gonna fuel make sure we can get a gyro like all the things that you need to get for those things i had to just pull it together you know it's you just have to do it you're just you're rolling with it you have to be so flexible with it Mm. which can be really fun yeah so and that reminds me what is it so you were in that world that that whole entertainment world for how long 12 years 12 years so um you know i I can imagine people say well you know those were uh, 12 years that were wasted uh you know so i agree because i spent like 17 plus 20 years in project management in some way shape or form and um before you know i made my career move and started doing something that i love which pays a lot less but is a lot more fun uh, so i recognize what you're saying about uh, your career shift and i found that to my surprise i the things that i learned in project management it's amazing how many things i still use not at the same level and not in the same way but I, you know, the stress, resi- stress resilience and, um, and stress management and, you know, budgeting if you, when you have to, those kinds of things. So useful. What about you? Oh, 
Yes. Everything that I learned in those 12 years prepared me to be a business owner today. I wouldn't have been ready otherwise. Mm. I One of my first jobs in production I'll, after you know, graduating from being a yeah. production assistant. Uh, and this is, you know, I should share this part too, because this is, a, this is about daring. Mm -hmm. There was a job that I was applying for, and it was to be a production manager at this company that was also overseeing the books. And at that point in my life, I was still, you know, I was a couple years out of college. I didn't, a few years out of college. And I didn't have any accounting experience. Mm. You know, I had done some, you know, uh, line producing type of, you know, budget on a, through movie magic budgeting, but not through like accounting software, like tracking expenses in yeah. more of a bookkeeping way. Mm. And so, but everything else about the job I knew I could do. And I applied for the job. And I wrote in my cover letter, look, I understand you're looking for someone who has X, Y, Z experience that I don't have, but I'm willing to learn. I will take a class. Mm -hmm. I, I fit every other box yeah. you need. Mm -hmm. I didn't get called back for two weeks. And so I kept looking and I looked at the job site and the ad was still there. And so I thought, oh, well, they're still looking for somebody. I'm going to try again. So I resubmitted mm -hmm. with the same thing. Hey, you might have overlooked me. I really would just love to have an interview. It turns out they didn't even get my first email. It had been buried under everything else they'd gotten. It got lost in some way. They didn't even get it. Mm. So it's a good thing I reached out again. And then I got this job. Yeah. And then the person who was leaving trained me in the accounting. I learned. I zoomed right up to I was hired as a production manager zoomed right up to a line producer on the first shoot because they needed someone to do it. and I said I can do this mm. and then just started you know working on you know projects that were you know half a million dollars and up within yeah. like the first <laughs> the first couple of projects working at this company but learning that learning the accounting learning budgeting learning project management learning time management learning mm. how to negotiate with vendors and with crew understanding how puzzle, you know pieces fit together talking yeah. to insurance agents dealing you know t contracts dealing with lawyers and and legal forms all those mm. things i did all of that so now that i have my own company i understand what's needed i yeah. know how to negotiate i feel confident stepping into spaces where maybe i'm the only woman or mm -hmm. i'm dealing with you know mostly men and and those who might try to talk over me i am very confident in speaking up and saying no i need this and this breakdown here's what i need and stepping away and finding someone else to help me if if they're not giving me what i need yeah and all of my experience led me to be able to do this. I still use some of the forms. <laughs> like I'll be like, oh yeah, this I'm yeah. gonna use this calendar form or I'm gonna use this form. I know. And, yeah. And I shoot my own series, Outdoor Defense. So mm. all my experience I've being on set and working with crew members. And then I've done some indie projects where I've done audio engineering. I did audio engineering when I was working with the military too, because we brought our own sound setup. Mm -hmm. And understanding cameras and the things that you need. I mean, now I produce my own series and I know what I need. I know taught myself how to edit. All of those things fit together and apply yeah. to what I'm doing today. Exactly. Exactly. So it's, it, I just wanted to highlight that because so many people listening and, you know, might be saying, you know, are around that time in their career or maybe just at an age where they're like, you know, is this what I want to do for the rest of my life, for the rest of my professional life? Are there things that I want to do differently or maybe I want to do something entirely different but and then there's reasons why they they think they can't and some of sometimes those reasons are you know I studied really hard I have this degree and that would be a complete waste of time energy and money if I now would throw that degree you know out of the window and start doing I don't know under ba underwater basket weaving or something like that where do I sign up for that? <laughs> I know. It's an example that I've heard at some point and I'm like, okay, you know, that's really out there. <laughs> but just as an example, and, and I'm like you, I'm like, I have, I, I benefit so much from the fact that I have 20 years of project management and interim management under my belt. And like you, I still use, um, you know, people think I'm incredibly organized, but I'm only organized because I was raised, grew up in a project management organization where you had to be organized because if something happened to me, somebody else needed to be able to step in and pick up where I left off. And I took that whole system with me, that, that way of thinking, that way of organizing my files and still there. I, in the ski school where I work in wintertime, I, uh, I'm, responsible or i used to be in the old ski school responsible for 
you know, and divvying up the kids that were coming to get instructions over the different um, groups. And, you know, on a Sunday morning, the first day of ski instruction, something like 100 kids with um, 200 parents and sometimes 150 grandparents, you know, are storming towards you and want to know which group they will be. And people were people around me were like, this is so stressful. And I was like, no, it's not. It's, you know, it's like an hour for uh, on one day. What are we talking about? So those kinds of things, is, you're trained to do that and you bring that experience with you to whatever it is that you want to do next. So it's not a waste. Yeah, I agree with you. The organization, yes, I do. I am very organized. In production, you have to be. You yeah. absolutely have to be. And I have friends that also run businesses or are working for other businesses and they look at what how I'm organizing everything and my file structure mm. on my hard drive where I keep things so I can find yeah. my what I need. They say, oh, wow, like this is more organized than you probably even need to be. But I like to be able to easily find my files. I like to be able to, if someone needs something to have it, I have, you know, backups of backups so that, yes. you know, I yeah. always want to have my, my paperwork in order. Like in production, you needed that. Like one mess up. Like you don't have that one insurance writer and yeah. now you're messed up or, oh, you didn't file the permit and the fire marshal comes and wants to see your permit at your location. Like that yeah. could lose thousands of dollars in a day yeah. if you mess up something. So mm -hmm. it's very much organized and meticulous. And now yeah. like I'm responsible for every aspect of the company, you know, CEO, chief everything officer for now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, I have to make sure that everything is, is taken care of because yeah. there's no one else that's going to do it for me. Exactly. Exactly. So let's change track a little bit. Um, you are a passionate outdoor person. You know, you hike, you I think you climb, you, um, you, you ride horses, you know, all those kinds of things. When did that come into your life? Oh, I've always been an outdoors person. I grew up in the desert of Southern California and I just loved being outside. Mm. Now, my family wasn't, I wouldn't consider my family outdoorsy. Um, but I just loved being outside. We yeah. took a couple of, you know, family vacations. I remember in my like, you know, teen years and we lived very close to Joshua Tree National Park, which mm -hmm. is a really well-known outdoor area. But living right there, you would think I visited all the time, but we didn't mm -hmm. as much as I would want, would have wanted to. Mm -hmm. But I was always passionate about things. I was into sports, so I played sports. <clears throat> I did whatever you could do mm -hmm. in the desert. And was always pushing to do more. But because we lived in a small desert town, accessibility to certain activities was very limited. My family wasn't always very supportive of me wanting to do these other things. Mm. And so I did what I could. And the moment I got my scholarship and got out of that town and went to college, mm -hmm. oh, I was all about it. I was all about trying to do as much as I could. Again, you know, money was an issue, right? I was a poor college student, just like mm -hmm. most of us are. Mm -hmm. Like I had a full scholarship to school, but that covers school. What about everything yeah. else you need? Mm. So I got a job right when I got to college and worked through college, two jobs plus an internship when I got up into my later years mm -hmm. and just did what I could. I, I would go horseback riding in Griffith Park because I loved horses growing up, but didn't get to ride horses growing up because we didn't have a horse. I think I spent like three months with a friend who had a horse and her mom gave me lessons mm -hmm. and taught me how to how to tack and, you know, all yeah. that groom and stuff and gave me some riding lessons. But I started doing more of that and doing more hiking. And then when I work, started working in production, we would travel. Mm -hmm. Well, then I got to travel and I would do things when we were already there. Oh, we're going to Miami. Great. I'm going to drive down to Key Largo or yeah, Key yeah. Largo and yeah. swim with dolphins. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're going to go here. Great. I'm going to do a stop off here. And I started expanding my trips, coming out a day earlier, leaving a day late or taking time off when we had, you know, a, a off day to do mm -hmm. these things. Yeah. I, you just, I always was so passionate about just trying new activities and growing up, I didn't get to. So when I became an adult, nothing could stop me. Like you just can't stop me. I had people telling me, oh, when, girls don't do that. Women don't do that. Black people don't do that. Mm -hmm. And I would just look at them and say, it doesn't matter to me what you think I should do. I mm -hmm. want to do this. This is something that brings me joy. You're not going to stop me. Yeah. Like, Don't project your insecurities or your fears or your stereotypes onto me. 
mm-hmm. because I'm still going to do whatever I want to do. I'm mm. going to go ride horses and skydive and scuba dive and climb. That's and right. You scuba dive as well. Parasail and, you know, and, and whatever else. Yeah. You know, snowboard, you, ice skate, you name it. Like, mm. I'm going to do the things that I want to do. If it, mm. if it sounds interesting and fun, I'm going to do it. Just this, this last year for my birthday, I jet skied from Catalina. I'm uh, sorry. I jet skied from Long Beach to mm-hmm. Catalina Island, mm-hmm. which is 26 miles across open ocean. I oh didn't even God. think, I didn't even know that was a thing you could do. I looked it up because I was looking for an adventure to do on my birthday that was something I'd never done. Mm-hmm. I found this and I called up my best friend. I'm like, hey, so you want to do this thing with me? And she said, sure. Because <laughs> it was my birthday. I wanted to share it with somebody. Mm-hmm. I would have just done it by myself, but I was like, yeah. it's my birthday. I want to spend it with a friend. Yeah. And then we, Jump, we did cliff diving. I wouldn't really call it cliff diving. We were jumping off some rocks. We got to snorkel. We swam through a cave and came back. So mm-hmm. I just find adventurous things, anything that's that seems fun, yeah. that blows my hair back. I'm a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. I am just down to try just it at least bit. once. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so you you go into this uh the the, the self defense and the um sexual assault prevention things um but I got to know you through your videos that you do on self defense in the outdoors you know you go out solo or as a small group of women and um you know I do not know of a woman that at some point in her life or you know unfortunately mostly multiple points in life have not been badgered by a man you know even if it's just the 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 cat calls and the door and the whistles and everything um and i know lots of women who you know who, who tell me uh, gerdy are you going by yourself into the mountains Is, isn't that scary mm-hmm. and it's not that they are they're asking you know it's not like uh, isn't it scary because you're afraid that you'll get lost but isn't it scary because of uh, potential people you might run into so how did when how and when did you start to combine those two things you know your passion for the outdoors and the self defense or the sexual prevention things i started combining them at the end of 2019 mm. and i did it because i had been prodded and pushed by friends and family for a couple of years prior to that telling mm-hmm. me that i should combine the two Mm. But I was stuck in my own head thinking, no, I have to keep these two separate. I can't put them together. You know, mm-hmm. hiking and outdoors is one thing and self-defense is another. I, I can't put them together. It's like mixing oil and water. It's, you know, people are going to wonder what I'm doing. And so I was really resistant to putting it together. I thought I needed to, I thought I was doing a better job of just keeping them separate. Mm-hmm. And at the end of 2019 or mid, mid to end of 2019, I had a friend who kind of just gave me the last motivational kick in the butt that I needed to just start out what is now outdoor defense. Mm -hmm. She's like, you just need to do this because people are, you know, people are, would love to watch it. And women are concerned, not just women, people of all genders have concerns about being solo and just put them together and just make videos. And I, you know, I thought, okay, all right, fine. I'll just, you're right. I'll just start. I didn't even know what I was going to talk about it. I just went to a trail brought a little tripod with my camera and that was the yeah. first episode of outdoor defense. And then it's just grown and it hit a nerve that I didn't think I was going to connect with people in that way, mm-hmm. but it really resonated with people. And I, now I'm thinking, gosh, why didn't I start this sooner? But you know, all things in time. Yeah. You know, sometimes there is a time for everything and uh, apparently you were not ready to start doing it earlier. So, yeah. so what is um, the biggest feedback you get on those videos or on those trends because you don't just do the videos you also do them live i've seen you do them with uh, with other people yeah so i so most of the videos i do by myself sometimes mm-hmm. i have my colleagues from impact personal safety I, I also work for that company as a lead instructor and a board yeah. member so sometimes they will come and we'll do a, a live demonstration with someone in a padded suit a co-instructor in a padded suit yes mm-hmm. and I sometimes have had a friend, like I had my friend Erica came with her dog so we could talk about self-defense if you have your dog with you. And the most feedback that I get is people people thanking me, people telling me that it has helped them feel more confident, that it has helped them feel more capable in being able to go out and do a solo hike or mm. it just opened their eyes to something they didn't even consider and helped them feel more powerful. And yeah. that's the best feedback anybody could give me. Yeah. 
Yeah, because that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you because, you know, I told you I did um, a video series about safely hiking mountains and it never even occurred to me to think about the safety aspect, that aspect of safety is, you know, and I said in the introduction, I'm six foot one, I think, if, if I calculated that correctly. I have short hair. I have a rather low voice for a woman, you know, and now not so much because my weight seems to have decided that it needs to sit on my hips. <laughs> so, but I used to have what I called Miss Twiggy hips. So, you know, I didn't get bothered a whole lot because... You know, I was often mistaken for a man. And also, I just go through the world assuming that nobody's going to bother me. And that helps, I think, when you have that uh, basic attitude. But yeah, you know, I should have thought of it because lots of people are like, you know, how about that? How about that aspect of going solo into nature? And let's be fair, you know, it's not just I feel more unsafe when I'm in an urban environment than when I'm in nature to be totally yeah. honest same i think it, it has to do with comfort part of it's the comfort level of folks that maybe haven't gone out in nature very much and there's a lot of fear and a lot of myth out there in the world that yeah. assumes that oh if you go outdoors that suddenly now you're going to be more at risk than you were in an urban environment or a city yeah. environment and and the underlying message is that once you're out there by yourself, there's nothing you can do if something happens. And mm. that's a lie Yeah, because you are more than capable of being able to protect yourself. The idea that, well, now nobody can come and help you. Well, you don't need anyone to come and help you. Yeah. You're more than capable of being able to help and protect and defend yourself if you need to. Yeah. And the fact is that 86% of the time, at least in the U.S., 86% mm -hmm. of the time women are assaulted by someone they know. It's that the means, same all over, I think. Yeah, yeah, that means your home environment is statistically less safe for you if we're talking about domestic violence and intimate yeah. partner abuse, you know, gender-based violence, than going out and potentially running into, mm -hmm. you know, a stranger on the trail. Or, you know, the hiking partner that you're with that you're, oh, I'm not solo, but, you know, that is something that yeah. it, it's... It's something that you need to consider that it's not necessarily always a stranger. It could be someone you know. And that's why I teach things that apply not just to strangers, but it talks mm. about setting boundaries of people you know, too. And yeah. That's not to say everyone we meet has you know bad intentions. That's not what no. I'm saying at all. No. But the idea that we should only be fearful of strangers out in the wilderness and not have that same awareness when we are in a city environment dealing with a coworker or a family member or a friend mm. It's it just means we need to use our senses no matter where we are and understand okay. that we have options. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and that's what I like about your videos. You know, I'm in, the, in, I'm in Europe, so my chances of being trained live by you are limited uh, for, at least for now. And um, but your videos are really clear. I encourage anybody who wants to know a little bit more about how can I set boundaries? How can I set, you know? defend myself if I need to if somebody gets you know a bit too close or for comfort or or goes beyond that you know what can I do because there's quite a lot you can do you know and you do not have to be six foot one to do it oh absolutely not I just taught a high school class yesterday and you know these are girls they're 14 15 years old mm. and they're unleashing fury <laughs> against it's, our padded instructor when we're teaching, you yeah. know, when I'm doing an impact class and I remind them like, you're powerful. There's actually a study. I, I can't quote it directly now because mm -hmm. I, of course I don't have it memorized, but mm -hmm. I'm happy to send it to you if you want. But it's, it talks about the dynamic that a lot of times people think that because of the power dynamic of, you know, assuming in the binary, oh, men are stronger, they're more powerful, yeah. they have more institutional power. That means there's nothing that you can do if you have less power or mm -hmm. are smaller quote unquote, weaker person. And it points out that no matter how big and tall and strong someone is, they're going to have vulnerable spots in their body. Yes. And no matter how self-described petite or small you claim to be or you think you are, you still have strong parts on your body and hard parts on your body that you yeah. can use to hit a vulnerable spot. Exactly. We are not helpless. So I'm trying to just change that, change that narrative and, mm. and remind people we're not helpless, remind people that we have options 
and that we don't have to limit our life. And exactly. oh, don't go, you know, people say, oh, don't go hiking solo because it's not safe. I'm never going to tell someone don't do something. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say, use your awareness. I'm going to go out solo. But say I run into someone or a situation where I think to myself, hmm, this isn't great. I might turn around and go home. Yeah. I might make that decision. Yeah. But that's making a decision based on the situation, not just mm. completely deciding I'm not going to do these things. Yeah. Because... Assuming that something may or may not happen. Right. Yeah. You know, and full disclosure, I am a survivor of violence mm-hmm. and abuse. And mm-hmm. it I'm in that 86% statistic. It was yeah. happened at home with people I knew. You know, so what was what were the don'ts I was supposed to follow to keep myself safe? You know, yeah. well, I well, I wasn't out drinking. I was too young. I wasn't what I was wearing. I wasn't out late. I wasn't with a stranger. I wasn't by myself. Like all the things I say, oh, don't don't do this. Don't do this. Yeah. It's like those don'ts only serve to limit our life and take away our control of, of what we can do. The options we do have. We're never responsible for preventing violence from happening against us. And we're Mm -hmm. never to blame for something that happens. Mm -hmm. But I don't think offering these don'ts is something that's very empowering. So instead, I want to help people open their world by giving them education. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry that happened to you. but And at the same time, look at the power that you now exude. You know, just the way you talk and the way you move. People can't see that. But, you know, (laughs) I can. And I'm telling you guys, she's... You, you exude confidence, which is, you know, beautiful to see, but also in your videos. Because every now and again, I'm like, oh, when something, when somebody comes up to me on the trail and I don't really trust it or they are coming too close and I have to do this, you know, take up the stance and put my hands in front of me and yell no. You know, there's this little bit of, um, I'm going to look silly when I do that. And at the same time, who cares that you're looking silly? You're keeping yourself safe. So, you know, look silly. All, who yes, cares? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So another thing you do, which I find incredibly, um, uh, you know, it's interesting, but also incredibly important is black girls tracking. And, yes. um, and, you know, I'm from Europe and Europe is an incredibly wide space. The Alps are an incredibly wide space. Um, the outdoor industry, like the American outdoor industry, is an incredibly wide space. Um, and at the same time, in the United States, there's this whole discussion going on of Black Lives Matter and everything else, which is not happening in Europe. It should, you know, because we have similar problems. They are just a little bit less on the surface. Um, and there's this whole history of Black people. You know, you said it yourself a couple of minutes ago. Uh, even black people probably say this to one another. Uh, you know, we don't go into the outdoors. We don't do these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. So how did you get into black girls trekking and why is it important? I had been following Tiffany, who's one of the co-founders on Instagram. And she told me, this is back in 2017, she messaged me and said she was starting a group, a hiking group for black women and asked mm. if I'd like to join and go on hikes if they did. And I said, yes, absolutely. I had mostly been hiking solo or sometimes I'd hike with a friend if they were around. But, you know, I I like to go hiking solo because I don't have to wait on anyone's schedule. And I also like the meditativeness of yeah. just being mm-hmm. solo in the outdoors. And I had hiked with other groups that weren't black, you know, weren't mm-hmm. primarily black women. They were primarily white women. I didn't have any bad experiences with those groups. They were all lovely. But at the same time, I'm walking into that space as a black woman, understanding that I am one of the only, if not the only yeah. one of one only of a few, few black women. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So it's like people don't maybe necessarily try to other you, but you're already in a space in which you are other. Yeah. And it was exciting to think of oh my goodness i'm gonna be able to hike with other black women and so i i started with the group as a member i was asked to become an adventure leader and now i'm an adventure leader and now the fact that i can take other black women on hikes that some of the times they've never been on a particular hike so it's their mm-hmm. first time on a trail i'm being able to explain it to them i am super nerdy about like the plants and the animals and i'm always pointing things out and i'm yeah. very excited about it because i'm very curious and being able to give them that experience that i never got to have when i first got on the outdoors i think that's so powerful mm. to be able to have them learn and and be in a in a in a group where it's safe, where they don't, where we don't feel othered, where we don't yeah. feel 
Like we have to censor ourselves to fit in. We can just be. Mm. And for some black women, you know, maybe this is their their first time getting into the outdoors because they've always thought, oh, it's not safe or it's not something that we do or they weren't supported in their family or friends group to try it. And now they get to try these things mm. and and have these experiences in a in a place where they can be safe and be vulnerable and be empowered. Yeah. And I think it's so important to to have this group and to have groups like ours. And in the U.S., up until recently, within, I think, in the 1960s, up until mm. the 1960s, 1970s, black people, it was illegal for us to go to a lot of national parks. So, I mean, so we're talking about one generation ago. My dad yeah. wasn't able to go to national parks. So yeah. if you I have was born family, in the 60s, so, you know. Yeah. So this this idea of, of, I mean, people say, well, why do you need groups like this? Well, because we were forbidden from accessing outdoor spaces for mm. hundreds of years, yeah. which is why the outdoor space is very white, because they were the only people who were yeah. actually allowed access. And you know, it became part of you know family traditions. Well, our families didn't get to have those traditions. We weren't allowed to go into those spaces. Yeah. So and, now mm. we're trying to to show that we not only belong, but we are here and we're going to yeah. take up space and we're going to keep being here. Yeah. And then there's was another aspect that I can't remember who said it, but I heard it on a podcast and um, uh, I think it was a black guy. If I can, can I say it like that? That's also something, you know, which words can you use? But a black guy was talking about hiking and about the outdoor space and why black people, perhaps even especially black men, didn't go didn't like to go into forests. It was like um, back in those days, you know, back in the time of segregation and uh, just after slavery, the forests were places where people of color, you know, got killed, lynched, yeah. and all other terrible things. So that, yeah. so it was a space that you were taught to avoid instead of look up and enter into to just, you know, um, what do you call that for leisure. Yeah. So it's, it, that that whole history is also in there. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when when black people were enslaved, our connection to the land and to nature was severed with it. You know, we're taken yeah. away from our home country to a country exactly. we don't know and you know, that, and nature is so healing and just so good for your mental health and it's mm -hmm. good for your physical health and I want to encourage more black people, more BIPOC individuals yeah. to get outside and to connect, reconnect with nature, find that healing, that that space where you can exist and see the beauty that's out there and understand that nature doesn't care what you look like. It's not Absolutely the nature not. that we are worried about when we go in the outdoors. We understand that we're worried about the people or potentially animals, mm. <laughs> but you know, nature the the rocks the trees the mountains the snow like it it, it that those are not the gatekeepers so no. when we can try to change the narrative and and change it so people understand that nature shouldn't be something that we of we prevent certain people from accessing or mm -hmm. make certain people feel uncomfortable accessing or yeah. you know make a big deal about oh my gosh i've never seen someone who looks like you out here you know what that's not that's not helpful <laughs> just <laughs> let's just let's just acknowledge each other like you normally do hiking hey how are you doing good all right great yeah. and just keep going it doesn't need to be a big deal oh my god i've never seen a, another black person out here uh, that's that's not helpful <laughs> no no it's it's not like it's not like a carnival it's, it's yes. just somebody enjoying the outdoors just like you and i are enjoying the outdoors yes. exactly yeah yeah i don't want to you know i want to be conscious of uh, the the time we spent with, with each other um so this is going to be a weird jump but i'm going to make it anyways i always ask my client my clients my guests um three questions and they are, what is a favorite book of yours with nature as a main character? What is a favorite movie with nature as a main, uh, main character? And what is a favorite, what is it that I asked? Book, a movie, a music, piece of music. And I always give people <laughs> the time to think about this because if I just drop it on them, you know, if somebody were to drop it on me, I would have stuttered because when I th started thinking about my own answers to these questions, I was like, Oh, these are not as easy as I thought they are. So you've had time to think about it. And you told me you've got answers. So I'm 
sitting here with my pen at the ready. <laughs> what yes. are those answers? I did my research. I did my <laughs> research. All right. So picking a favorite book was hard. Okay. But I picked The Sixth Extinction by James Rollins. The Sixth and dix- Distinction? Extinction. Oh, the Sixth. Okay. The Sixth Extinction by James mm-hmm. Rollins. And I I read it a while ago, so I can't tell you the exact details of the book, but I just mm-hmm. know it was about nature, the connection with, you know, nature, plants and animals. There's mm-hmm. an extinction event happening and the characters are trying to figure out, you know, what's going on and, and how it all fits together. And I love mystery kind of sci-fi, yeah. like suspense adventure books. So it was perfect. And nature was a main character. I'm going to look it up because I, <laughs> I like those same kinds of books. Great. My favorite piece of music, that's hard, but I picked one okay. and it's by a uh, Hawaiian singer named uh, Israel Kamako Vivo Ole and it's oh. his song White Sandy Beach. Oh, I can find the song probably because I would not, never be able to just write his name, White Sandy Beach. White Sandy Beach of Hawaii, I think is what okay. the, the whole name is. Mm-hmm. So and what about that song makes it a favorite of yours? It's just beautiful. He has a beautiful voice and he's talking about, you know, his homeland and mm-hmm. the nature and the connection that he has to the ocean and to the sand and how it speaks to his soul. And he's very soulful as he's singing it. Oh. Cool. It's beautiful. Cool. And the movie. Um. Okay. I would say my favorite nature movie is Wings of Life by Disney. And it's narrated by Meryl Streep. Okay. And it's a look at how pollinators and flowers, it's a love story between them. And it talks about how the pollinators are really the ones in charge of making sure life on this planet happens. So it talks mm. about the bees and the hummingbirds and bats and moths and other insects that are responsible for pollinating flowers and the connection between the flowers and the pollinators. Wow. It's beautiful. It sounds beautiful. And I love a good nature movie. So um, that's one that's going on my list. So cool. So I have one final question uh, for you. And now this is one I'm going to drop on you. Um, okay. What is one thing listeners can do that you would give them um, and it's you know it can be something easy but what is one thing that they can do to in your case I'm going to say safely connect with nature um, you know maybe on a daily basis, basis even but just something easy I'd say one thing you can do to connect with nature is just go outside your apartment your house wherever you're living just go outside and if you're in an urban environment, you might have to walk to like a nearby park or maybe there, mm-hmm. maybe your neighbor has a garden or maybe there's a beautiful tree like somewhere. Yeah. Just find some piece of nature that you can connect with. Take a moment, close your eyes and just take a deep breath and let it out. Just breathe that fresh air and just allow yourself to be for a moment. Yeah. Good one. Good one. Where can people find you? And especially where can people find the outdoor uh, defense uh, videos just on the Instagram or do you have them anywhere else as well I have them on Instagram and on YouTube so I have a YouTube oh, okay. channel they can subscribe to my YouTube channel I have a playlist just for outdoor defense episodes season three comes out next year mm-hmm. I'm really excited but there's 44 episodes out right now 44 okay. different ones you can Links watch now will be on the in the show notes as to say mm-hmm. yes yeah. And then I'm also on Instagram. My handle is Adventures of NIK. And I also have my company's Instagram, which is Girls Fight Back. Mm-hmm. And my website is NicoleSnell.com. You can find everything on there. Links to GirlsFightBack.com and links to Outdoor Defense, my videos. I have a solo travel video for sale there. Information, articles, pretty much anything that you would need, <laughs> you can find it on NicoleSnell.com. But I would Great. love to hear from y'all and follow me on social media and reach yeah. out if you have questions. Great, Nicole. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me a guest. Herdi. Yay. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You've been listening to Daring Self-Leadership and the Nature Connection. You can find the show notes for this episode and every other one on the podcast page on the Dare Greatly Coaching website. The podcast is available wherever you like to listen and it's hosted by me, Gerdy Verwoerd. 
The music is Butt Bursting by Poddington Bear. Thank you for being with me today. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode. And in the meantime, as always, go there greatly.